Good morning. Good morning. Nice to have a time with you this morning after a night's rest. Uh, our second study in our series, devotional, I've entitled The Prince of Darkness. Yesterday we considered briefly the idea of what the Bible means by the truth. Um, these two principles uh, that are contending for supremacy, one of them was the truth, the other was what? The lie. And we described these two principles in multiple ways, one of which was the principle of the truth, the Bible says, is light. Remember Jesus said uh, when he came into the world, he, he's the one that brings light to all people in the world. Well, then if, there's a, if he's the prince of light, there must be someone who's in charge of the opposite principle, and I call him the prince of darkness. I believe there's actually a hymn we sing that has this phrase in it. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. Remember that one? It's the mighty fortress is our God. So it's, it's a phrase that we've used, although the Bible doesn't speak of him specifically this way. It talks about the powers of darkness. What is the dark principle? Um, recall yesterday we talked about John 8, 44. In some ways, it's probably the most important verse that lays these two principles side by side. Uh, in that verse, Jesus described who this was. Do you remember who he, what, what was the name Jesus used for him there? He's actually talking to his fellow Jewish people, and he says that they were not Abraham's children. Even though they had come down from Abraham, they could trace back their lineage to Abraham in their human lineage, but they weren't acting like Abraham. They were planning to do what? Remember the passage? What were they planning to do with Jesus? They are planning to kill him. And Jesus plainly said, Abraham wouldn't do this. You're of your father, the devil. That's right. The devil, he said, was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. We looked at this yesterday. Where did God place Lucifer when he first created him? He wasn't, he wasn't created as a devil, right? He was not created as Satan. When God created him, his name was Lucifer, which actually is a nice name if we look at it, which we will. When God created him, he put him in the truth which means he, along with all the other beings, were to live in this principle of the truth, this principle of light, this principle of giving. Um, but he did not stay there. This is what Jesus says. He abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Did you know you can get to the place where there's nothing, there's no light in you? You're just full of darkness. You're thinking so much about yourself that that's all there is. You have no time for anybody else. You're just all into yourself. It's a pretty dark experience. There's no light in him. When he speaks the lie, and you may have looked this up in your Bible and you wonder why it doesn't say the lie. It may say a lie. But I can assure you in the original it says the lie, just like it says the truth. When he speaks the lie, he speaks of his own. For he's a liar and the father of it. And the it is singular. You know your English grammar? The it is singular and it's a... It's a pronoun referring back to an antecedent. The antecedent, obviously, there is the lie. John 8, verse 44. But look at that word murderer. Jesus may have used it because they were planning to kill him, but here he says, you're acting like your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. Do you remember anything about the story of the beginning of Lucifer? Do you remember any, any record in the Bible of him killing anyone in heaven? Was there anybody who ever died in heaven? There was a battle there, right? Did anyone ever die there? Why was Jesus calling him a murderer from the beginning? I believe, as I've noted here, if the lie is the principle that the way to live is to take, not give, what's the ultimate thing you can take? It's somebody else's life. And so as soon as he fathered that principle, Jesus knew where it would lead. It would lead to murder. And of course, a lot of people have been murdered. But of all the people whose life was taken, whose was the most significant? This one who is talking and describing this. Um, actually, he does say at one point, no one takes my life. I lay it down. So the ultimate form of giving is what? Giving your life. So that's why the Bible calls Jesus a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. 
As soon as this principle was fathered, Jesus knew that the devil would take life and he knew that he would give his life. But how does God give his life? He's giving life all the time, is he not? We read a statement where the life flows from the Father to all. But yet that is not showing the full horror of this principle of the lie. God had to become a human being in order to show that. Because God cannot die. So really to give life, to give your life, he had to become a human being. Jesus explains what was behind this event when the, when the lie was fathered by the devil. And it's in verse in the earlier chapter. He that speaketh of his, himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh the glory of him that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Do you see the two principles in that very verse? You have someone who is doing what? He's seeking his own glory. Selfishness, right? The earthly systems that, have, that we're in, if you really think about it, that we're immersed in, they're systems that are just focused on people being elevated and seeking their own glory. Competing for that, right? Competing for that in, in all areas of life. But Jesus says, the one that seeks not his glory, but the glory of him that sent him, the same is true, and there's no unrighteousness in him. So let's put these two principles side by side based on this verse. And I'm actually quoting, there's a, this, that's John 7, 18, John 8, 28, as well as the one that we just read in 8, 44, uh, are where these phrases come from. Jesus said, I do nothing of myself, which means... In our lingo, I'm not on my own ego trip. Okay, I'm here for someone else's business, someone else's glory. Um, and obviously, we can say it's the Father's glory, but he came down here really for us, right? He came to reveal the Father to us. The opposite then is speaking of yourself. Um, you may know people who like to talk about themselves all the time, and they're just totally oriented to, to self. The truth seeks the glory of him that sent him. And of course, Jesus talking about himself is talking about his father there. The contrast is seeking your own glory. And then Jesus says, if you're not seeking your own glory, you're seeking the glory of him that sent. In other words, the glory of God. You're, the same is true. That's the adjective for the noun that we've been looking at, the truth. So these things are all connected if you look at them very carefully. The opposite of that is what? If you're speaking the lie, that's why he called Satan a liar, the devil a liar. Righteousness, and then he says, there's no unrighteousness in him. If you're seeking the glory of God, there's no unrighteousness in, in, in you, which means you are righteous. This is what the principle of righteousness is all about. Not, not focused on self, but focused on others, and the other being God. And then after him, all others. Is that not the two great commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That means you're not loving yourself, right? And then after God comes, your neighbor as yourself. Unrighteousness is the opposite of righteousness, obviously. The best text, I think, on the beginning of the lie is given for us in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, and I'm sure it's one that you're somewhat familiar with. Here's how it reads. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? This is a lament. Um, in our society, we don't do much lamenting. But some, some cultures, whenever there's a, a disaster, a death, people lament. They write, they write things about it. They, they weep and they cry. Um, this is a lament, and it's a lament over this being called Lucifer, son of the morning. Lucifer comes from a word meaning the shining one. Do you see? That's why I'm saying he was not the prince of darkness to start with. He was the shining one. Obviously reflecting whose glory? Glory of the God. Glory of his Father. Glory of the Creator. And we saw that the glory of God in the statement we looked at yesterday from Desire of Ages, the glory of God is to give. To give. 
the principle of giving. So this being, son of the morning, and I think that alludes to the fact that he was apparently the first creature from the hand of the Creator to reflect his glory, to reflect his glory, to shine, to shine. Lucifer is actually a translation of the Hebrew. The Hebrew means shining one. Lucifer is actually a word that means the light bearer, someone carrying light. Uh, Lucy is light and fair is the word we get fairy from, some, something that's carrying something. Um, Lucifer. For thou hast said in thine heart, continuing the passage here, so the, when he speaks the lie, it started where? It started in his heart. Okay? This is just opening his heart for us and letting us know what was going on inside of his heart there. What was inside there? Well, you know the phrases, I will ascend into heaven. It's sort of strange because that's where he was already, but this is not that point. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. So the question is, which direction does the lie like to go? Up, right? Just climbing, climbing, climbing. If you get in the way, what happens to you? Walk right over you, right? That's the idea. I'm going up. I'm exalting myself. I'm going up and up and up. But then the exaltation, as we obviously see from this, is not of others. It's the exaltation of self. I would say the exaltation of others is another way to describe what the truth is all about. When Jesus was here, we are told even as a child, as a young person, he, he was sensitive to others' needs. He sought out people who, were, who needed help, and he helped them out. That's lifting others up that are in need. That's what the truth looks like. Uh, that's what unselfishness looks like. But we are so bent on self because we are contaminated with the lie. It's in our genes, as we say. It comes down to us from Adam and Eve that we have to learn how to be unselfish. And how do you learn to be unselfish? You actually have to see it. You have to behold it. And of course, the greatest example of unselfishness is Jesus. So you have to spend time with him. Hopefully you have some people around you that are modeling it as well, because that's the type of people you want to spend time with and look at. Very, very important that you do that. The concluding statement in this verse says, um, really shows who the lie is really about. What was the concluding uh, phrase? We haven't read it. Remember what he says in the Bible? I will be like the Most High. I believe that's the, the, the clearest statement as to what the lie that the devil fathered is all about. So he pictures himself going up, 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 and then he says, I will be like the Most High. The implication is, the Most High is like that. He's self-exalting. And we saw yesterday that it's exactly his position. He denies the existence of what? Unselfishness. So if unselfishness does not exist, that means God himself is selfish. God himself is on this ego trip. He got to where he, he is by going up. I'm going to be like him. And of course, that is not the truth. <laughs> That is the lie. And the idea that we can think that we can live that way, exalting ourselves, putting others down, is the greatest lie that we struggle with. Um, and I would say the greatest lesson we need to learn is the truthfulness of the truth. Not just the truthfulness of us, but, but we need to learn to love it. Do we love the opposite? What's, do we love unselfishness? What's the opposite of going up? Going down. What did Jesus do to save us? We have no idea how far down he came. But Jesus did that for the joy set before him. Have we found that joy of going down, helping others, ministering to people's needs? So this dark principle, the shining one became the prince of darkness, in charge of what the Bible calls the powers of darkness, Jesus used that term when he was talking to the Jewish people as his death neared. This is your hour and the power of darkness. No longer a giver. When he stopped giving, 
the light went out. The light went out. May Daystar live up to its name. That sounds like a place of light, does it not? Daystar. The Daystar just came across the hill, right? Full flooding this valley with light. May this academy be a place of light. Even though it's in a valley, not on a hill, it will be a high place because people will see light coming from it. They'll say that's where people are that are unselfish. They're giving. And they're not thinking of themselves. They're, they're training young people there to live that way, to be of service to their fellow men. So he comes down to Eve one day, and what does he do? He attempts to sell her the lie. And this is one of the versions that translates his words. You will not die. You remember the story. Take the tree, you'll die. And he says, no, you will not die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That seems to ring a bell with what he said he wanted to do, be like God. I see this is what this verse is saying. Here's the truth and the lie. God is looking out. This is actually the truth, which... which Adam and Eve were placed in when they were created. God is looking out for you. He is keeping from you only that which would harm you. Be unselfish like him. The devil comes along and he says, look out for yourself. God is keeping something from you that will make you like him. He doesn't want you to be like him. Go and take it. And he convinced her that that was the way to live. That that was the truth. Now, if it's the way to live, it just makes sense. You're not going to die, right? So I believe the statement, you're not going to die, is denying the consequences of the lie. And that's what he did. And what did she do? Well, she bought it. And Adam took it with her, right? And that's why we're where we are. Next, next idea, the next story we want to look at, we mentioned briefly yesterday about Job. The truth about Job is what God said about him. Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and turns from evil? That means Job must have been unselfish. Was he a poor man? No, he was one of the wealthiest men there was. Can you be wealthy and unselfish? Yes, you can be. Uh, not as common to see unselfish rich people that are unselfish is it is to see rich people that are selfish. But you can be. And obviously they are finding the joy of, of giving. Um, they're, not, they're not hoarding their wealth just for themselves. But the devil says this in response to God. Does Job fear God for not? In other words, he's serving you. He's, he says he's yours, but he's just doing it for what he can get out of it. He's not serving you for nothing. So he's denying their unselfishness, and he's insisting that no one has an unselfish motive. And so that's why the whole story of Job unfolds. What did God tell the devil to do then? He's in your hands. If you think he's serving me for what he's got, take what he's got from him and see if that's why he's serving me. And that's the whole story of the book of Job. An amazing story. Uh, very painful experiences he went through, losing everything other than his own life and his wife. But through it all, through that mighty struggle he went through, chapter after chapter of, of dialoguing about this, God at the end says, Job has said what was right about me. But Job himself realized, I'm just a human being. And he really had to throw himself back on God totally in a deeper way than he ever had before. What about Jesus' own disciples? Have you thought about this in, in light of their, their, their experience walking with Jesus? This is an experience where Jesus is talking about rich people won't get into heaven or have a difficult time. I'm not, I shouldn't say won't get into heaven. He says it's very difficult because, again, we want to keep things for ourselves. And Jesus, uh, Jesus in response uh, to Jesus' statement, Peter said, we have forsaken everything. Speaking about the disciples, right? They had given up everything for Jesus. And we followed you, but what does he ask then? What shall we have therefore? Do you think Peter was fully cured of the lie? Was he serving Jesus for nothing? Just for the love of Jesus? 
No. He's asking the question, we've given up everything, what are we going to get back? Do we see that in their experience with Jesus as they walked with him? How unselfish was their motive? And how, how look, at, look at their experience with Jesus as they walked along with him. Um, Jesus' reply to Peter focused on this idea of following him. Peter thought he was following him. He'd forsaken all and followed him. But when it came down to it, do you remember the story? When it came down to the where, where push meets shove, as we say, where, where the, the chips were really down, and Jesus was taking, arrested and was going to be taken to trial, was Peter following Jesus then? No. When your best friend gets arrested and is headed to judgment and probably death, and you take off, who are you thinking about? You're thinking about yourself. So Peter's motive, he didn't realize it, what was in his heart. God let him see what it was like through the circumstances of life. He could have learned it because Jesus warned him that that was going to happen. But again, sometimes we have to learn the hard way. If we can't learn the easy way, God gives us another chance to learn the hard way. If we don't learn the hard way, it's like, what more can I do to teach you? So, Jesus said to them, if any man will come after me, here's, here's how Jesus describes how to follow him. If any man will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. Was Peter denying himself? No, he was saying, Lord, I will die for you. I will never give up on you. That's not denying self. That's exalting self. I'm able to do it. I can do it by myself. And of course, he was, he was really weak inside. But when we deny ourselves and we have to admit, Lord, there's nothing in me other than love of self. I need your power. I will, I will forsake you when you need me the most without total dependence upon you. That's what we have to do. Deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow him. It's not something we do just at the beginning of our Christian life. So, the truth and the lie here. Whosoever will save his life, this is Jesus' continuation. If you're going to save your life, this is the truth. If you're going to save your life, what's going to happen? You're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, if you're, if you're into giving yourself, for my sake, you will save it. What does the lie sound like? Well, I would say just the opposite. Whoever saves his life, saves it. And whoever loses his life, loses it. But that's the lie. That's the lie. Do the disciples continue to love the lie? Well, right there at the Lord's Supper, when he's giving them the emblems of his broken body and his spilled blood, which is the greatest gift the universe has ever seen, giving of himself. He gives them these emblems, and Luke records there was strife among them as to which of them should be accounted the greatest. Can you imagine that? Christ's own closest followers at the Lord's Supper, arguing among themselves who's the greatest. Still in love with the lie. And Jesus again confronted them with the truth. He that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, let him be as, as he that doth serve. And so Jesus did what with his, his own disciples? He girded himself and he washed their feet. He washed their feet. In that culture, that was very low to do that. Did the disciples ever learn to love the truth? Eleven did. We know one never did. He was so into himself that he finally did the ultimate form of taking, he took life, right? And it was his life. He committed suicide. But eleven did. And, and it happened because of the cross. They saw their selfishness in contrast to his unselfishness. They, their love of the lie versus his love of the truth. And Jesus came back to them after the resurrection. It says here, he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. We do not understand the scriptures unless we can trace, as we saw, the through history and prophecy, these two principles. And Jesus said to them, Thus as it is written, and thus it behooved Christ. Behooved means thus it was necessary. There was, nothing other, there was nothing else I could do. This is what I came here for. To suffer, which is again a picture of giving in the presence of taking. That's what suffering is. It's giving in the presence of taking. In heaven, they'll be giving, 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 but no taking. And so there's no suffering in heaven. 
But here, when you're a giver and there's takers around, we call that suffering. It's behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Suffer and to enter into his glory. Before the glory can be seen, the suffering comes along. And so what do the disciples do? They, they actually embrace the cross. They embrace the truth. And every single one of those 11, save one, died a martyr's death. The ultimate thing they could give, their lives for Christ. And they tried to kill John. Remember the story? They, they tried to deep fry him, put him in boiling oil, and he wouldn't, couldn't kill him, sort of like the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. And so they banished them to this island called Patmos. And Jesus gave him revelation there. Another way to describe what the lie does, just in closing here, Ezekiel, another passage on the one who originated it, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. A sanctuary is a holy place. And holy means holy unselfish. That's a working definition that I've come to of what holy means. Holy means holy unselfish. So the lie defiles, and it defiles with self. That's, that's what defiles. And there's a lot of ways that looks. There's a lot of ways that looks. This is what the sanctuary is all about. Its purpose is to be a holy place. You are the temple of God. Individually, you're the temple. The Holy Spirit wants to dwell in you. If he does, he will, he will lead you into being unselfish. He'll lead you to be holy also. But that's where the defilement of the sanctuary comes, and that's where its cleansing is all about. So I, I think if we understand the sanctuary in that light, it really simplifies it. The sanctuary was given to us to show what a giver God is, giving himself constantly. His life, bread, light, intercession, it's all representing what God is giving. When Jesus cleansed the temple in his day, he spoke of how far the defilement would go. Destroy the temple, he says. So beyond defiling the temple, you can actually destroy it, right? And that's what the Jews were going to do. And he was talking about what? Himself. Destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. As he said, as we noted, no man takes my life, I lay it down of my own. So the ultimate form of giving, the greatest gift the universe has ever seen, was seen where? On the cross. Christ laying down his life. We will never appreciate that as we ought until we get to heaven. And we realize what he left, what he gave for us, who he is. Uh, we talk about Jesus, but we really don't have a grasp of really who he is uh, in, the, in the cosmic order of things. Ultimate form of giving. But we also see at the cross the ultimate form of taking. This is what the lie would do. It would take God off of his throne and it would kill him in order to put self there. Do you want to take God off the, off the throne in your life? Or do you want to crown him king? That's what crowning him king is all about. That means becoming unselfish as he is. Letting him guide you throughout everything you do, day by day, in your classes, in your work, in your relationships. He's king. I'm not in charge. I'm, I'm important to him. I'm so important to him that he died to save me. But I'm not the one in charge. He is. And I'm not, because self is all about the lie. Results of the lie, all you that labor and be heavy laden. That's exactly what the lie does. It's a heavy load. It's a rough life. The way of a transgressor is hard, as the proverb says. The solution of the truth, Jesus says, learn of me. Learn of me. What do we need to learn about of him? It says it right here. I am what? Meek and lowly in heart. That's the question I have for you. Do you love meek and lowly in heart? If you do, your labor and your heavy laden life will be lightened by the light of Jesus Christ. And you will find what? You'll find rest to your soul. The Sabbath is a sign of that because he's our creator and our redeemer. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. And so I ask you the question, do you want to embrace the cross to love meek and lowly in heart, to join God in giving? It's my prayer that you will. Each day, this day and every day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the chance to
reflect again on what a giver you are. And Lord, we confess that indeed the lie has contaminated all of us. This world we're in, our families, uh, our individual lives. And we see just a little bit of how horrible it is. And we pray for your cleansing. We pray for a supernatural love of the truth that we can really be drawn to what Jesus came to show us and hate sin as, as he hated it and love truth, love the truth about you. So guide us in that in a practical way today and as we continue to dialogue. In Christ's name, amen.